Um, good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this, the first event of VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series for spring 2019. I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, chair of the VIU History Department, and it is my honor to once again be serving as event moderator for the Colloquium Series this year. In a moment, I will be calling on Professor Terry Doughty from the VIU English Department to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Justin McGrail of VIU's Department of Art and Design, who will enlighten us on the heritage graffiti that has somewhat accidentally been emerging in Victoria. But first, I have two important duties to perform. One, please keep in mind and be respectful of the fact that whenever we meet on the VIU campus or anywhere in the greater Nanaimo area, we do so on the traditional territory of the Sunaimo First Nation. Two, I do need to acknowledge the vital moral and financial support the colloquium series receives from the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities, headed by Dr. Marnie Stanley. Now, I, if you're familiar with the series, I always like to throw a little creativity into that last thank you. And I often try to work in the topic of the day in some way as well. So I could have spray painted some really wild graffiti-like images that implied our thanks to the Dean, but as I have no artistic ability whatsoever, that really wasn't an option. But then I discovered that there is something called verbal graffiti, a term apparently used to describe all the ahs, ums, like, you know, elements that people put into their day-to-day -day speech patterns. Thus, without any further ado, here's my verbal graffiti tribute to Dr. Stanley and the Dean's office. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, uh, well, like, the funding that Marnie, you know, gives us is some um, really, well, basically, like, it's kind of, to be honest, uh, you know, um, really important, yeah. Uh, so anyway, like, it is what it is, but I mean, um, really, you know, basically, it goes without saying, uh, well, that, of course, we couldn't um, do, uh, like, these talks without, you know, like, the money that the dean um, really provides. Yeah. Uh, so, basically, I mean, we uh, really, at the end of the day, uh, just want, um, like, uh, you know, to basically, like, really say, um, thanks? Uh, yeah, anyway. Verbal graffiti, everyone. <laughs> oh, now, please welcome to the stage the much, much better spoken uh, Dr. Terry Doughty, who will introduce our equally better spoken featured speaker for today, Do Dr. Justin McGrail. Terry Doughty. Thank you, Tim. Always an interesting act to follow. I'm very pleased today to be introducing Justin McGrail. Not only has it been a pleasure to see Justin's career unfold as a professor of art history in the Faculty of Art and Design since 2004, but I've been fortunate enough to work more closely with him as we led interdisciplinary field schools titled Cultural Contact Zones Wrocław, Poland in 2012 and 2014. Our work there focused on examining the record of shifting cultural identities in a city that has been German and Polish and home to a large Jewish community. I can attest that Justin can change how you look at the urban environment. Most of you may not know Justin, so I'll just say a few words about his background and work. Originally from Toronto, he studied history and art history at McGill University in Montreal before moving to the University of Victoria, where he completed his PhD with a thesis titled Value Space and Architectural Geography of New Retail Formats on Southern Vancouver Island examining the design and impacts of retail architecture, specifically big box stores on urban planning and culture in Victoria, Duncan, and Nanaimo. His chapter, Big Box Land, New Retail Format, Architecture and Consumption in Canada, 
was published in the anthology Architecture and the Canadian Fabric in 2011. Urban scenes have long been at the center of Justin's life. Along with his academic work, Justin is a spoken word poet with over 25 years of performance experience in Canada and the US. His poems have appeared in Geist, Oratorialis, and Canadian Dimension, and have been heard on CBC Radio, Vancouver Co-op Radio, and Chile FM. He is as well a member of Meridian, a multimedia performance collaboration featuring digital video, ambient electronic music, processed vocals, and poetry, collaborating with colleagues from art and design and media studies. Justin's current research focuses on urban cultures, graffiti, street art, and vandalism. Inspired by his field work in Wrocław, he has been investigating the intersection of history, memory, graffiti, and art. In a university's Art Association of Canada 2014 conference session, aptly titled Appetite for Destruction, Vandalism as Culture, Justin presented a paper on the overwriting of identity in public spaces and on buildings in Wrocław. Now, I'm very interested to hear what he has found a little closer to home in Victoria. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Justin McGrail. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, all right, looks like we're good. It's, uh, it's a humbling thing, especially since today's talk will in part be about age, um, that uh, I'm at the point now where if I don't remember to print things in 14-point font, I can't read them necessarily accurately, but, uh, but that comes for us all. Uh, so our talk today is called Heritage Graffiti, Conserving Victoria's Anti-Preservationist Art. Graffiti is a contemporary issue about which everybody has an opinion. Graffiti is in public view. There's a lot of it, both in Canada and abroad. And most especially, it's illegal. It is vandalism. Not all of it, but certainly most of it. It visually imposes itself, drawing attention to itself. It is the visible trace of crime, crime that is also art. This prompts questions about law, order, crime, and especially about private property. Graffiti is political, even if it's not explicit so in content. In the words of Cedar Lewinson, all illegal art is a protest of some kind. And as such, all of it is political. Oh. Graffiti makes us think about art makes us think about questions about art. Where does art belong? Who gets to call themselves an artist? And who gets to say who isn't an artist? Along with questions about crime, graffiti also brings questions about art, which cannot be avoided or just taken as a given. Honestly, graffiti is a topic that is hard to find a middle neutral scholarly ground when you're working on the research. At least this has certainly been my experience in researching, writing, and presenting papers on graffiti, and it is something which my fellow uh, research have also vouched for. Plus, everybody's got an opinion, which is definitely not the normal case if you study art history. So this morning, I ask you to join me with an open mind, and also do not assume automatically that I am on the side of the miscreants. If somebody vandalized some of my stuff, I'd be mad. I suppose the question is, how long would I be mad? In the words of Detroit's Ellen Roof, graffiti is not meant to be liked. Now, about terms, what do I mean by heritage graffiti? Well, it's simple. It's graffiti that has, for various reasons, lasted or appears to be permanent. Graffiti as an art form is ephemeral, transitory. Works are not expected to last very long. And when they do, especially because of the actions of anti-graffiti bylaws, the result is what I call heritage uh, graffiti. 
I should also note that in graffiti, it is the act of doing graffiti rather than the finished work that seems to be the most important. Let's consider this photograph taken inside the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, Italy. Vietatos graveri sumiri, do not write on the walls. And I think as you can all see, this is a prohibition which has been turned into an invitation. The wall, this wall you encounter on the landing at the level of the nave vaults, which is used as a rest stop by visitors on their way up to the dome. It is public yet also discreet, which itself is remarkable when you're in the city of Florence. Given the historic uh, location of the wall and the regard given to historic sites in this tourism driven city, perhaps its defacement is a surprise. But really, on second thought, is it really a surprise? This wall pre presents a broad sampling of the kinds of texts you often see in graffiti. Names, names with personal affirmations, was here, romantic statements about love, bonds of friendships, there are lists of names and their visits, politics, humor, poetic observation, cartoonish drawings. These types of markings are neither especially original, nor are they likely to be the first graffiti that passerbys have seen. None of this is really surprising. Tourists have been leaving texts on walls at special, often sacred sites for millennia. What struck me was that the sign seemed to be having the opposite effect of its expressed purpose. Instead of stopping graffiti, it seems to suggest graffiti. A suggestion to all who see it, who momentarily, on their break low into the dome, must ponder the act of writing on the walls, and also if they need to be told not to do it. In fact, the, seam, the sign seems to visually anchor the wall. It's almost a compositional device and focus for the texts that are added. The sign is the focus of the graffiti. Is it possible that it increases graffiti rather than the opposite? I've assumed that this sign was the reaction to graffiti. The earliest year visible is 2007, so we can posit that sign and the wall paint are at least eight years old. This photo was taken in 2015. We can also say that this deterrence is not working. In fact, my wondering if the same, if the sign was not an inducement was actually confirmed when I came across a study reference that was done at the Central Washington State College in 1970. Two research found that the amount of graffiti increased after they put up a sign that said, do not write on the walls. In 2016, in January, the organization that oversees the cathedral, the Opera de Santa Maria del Fiore, decided to clean the walls, something that social media manager Alice Filippone declared had never been done before, which is not surprising now. Three months in, Realizing that their cleaning efforts could be undone by anybody with a Sharpie, the opera decided to take steps to prevent this from happening. A series of electronic tablets were installed at various spots in the cathedral, especially on the routes to the dome, which run an app that the opera created called Autography. Visitors are asked to leave a name or declarations on a touch screen, virtual graffiti. I noted in 2017, the walls were clean and the tablets were in use. As I say, it's the doing the graffiti that matters more than the finished product. And by giving people a way to do graffiti, it seems to have solved some of the vandalism. Now I'm also, I'm gonna use graffiti at a heritage site here just as the starting point. Victoria, BC is my focus. So I would like us to consider urban heritage how it gets produced, how it relates to history. Also, the use of the heritage terms and practices, because they are used by graffiti writers themselves, especially when memorializing figures from local subcultural history with monuments, a different form of heritage uh, graffiti. For instance, this is the Phillips Wall on Discovery Street, which is in the Rock Bay area of downtown in Victoria. It actually uh, consists of two walls, which you can see, both of which belong to the Phillips Brewery. 
Phillips Brewery was founded in 2001 and has managed to sustain an engagement with Victoria artists, bands, and graffiti writers since then. Over, the, over a summer weekend in 2008, 30 writers of renown from Victoria, the island, and Vancouver created the works that you're looking at now. Sometimes called a wall of fame, although one of the organizers told me he prefers to just call it the Phillips Wall, the services present a virtual history lesson of Victoria's scene and a lexicon of the different styles of graffiti. A video from that weekend showed writers on scaffolding washed reverently by the youth below. The wall is a memorial to the past, to the present, and to the future of the graffiti scene. It is a celebration of a heritage of graffiti. However, unlike other monuments of urban heritage, this one is not meant to last, and thus it is not subject to conservation efforts. A close work, a close look, as you can see here, shows the state of the walls, which I should add are south facing. And that was actually something that struck me the first time I really saw this on a summer day, was immediately how the natural environment is going to wear away the images and how that is appropriate for graffiti. Yet the Phillips wall, along with the second wall in Fernwood, are exceptions to the normal practices of graffiti, in which works are up for a while, but usually painted over. As well, I should mention, uh, the name Ghost, which you see here, just note that, uh, because that also speaks to one of the memorial functions of uh, graffiti, as uh, produced, or rather used, by the orators themselves. Uh, it is these exceptions to standard practice, these examples of the conservation of anti-preservationist art that inspired my research for today. Despite a staid national reputation, neatly summed up in the frequently heard descriptor, newly wed and nearly dead, Victoria, BC has in fact nurtured various urban youth subcultures, including skateboarding, hip hop, and graffiti. Since the 1980s, the exterior surfaces of the city have been home to tags and pieces by legions of writers who have gone on to earn considerable respect across Canada, including Ghost, Dewar, Dubnut, Pesto, Doofer, Insight, and others. Like most Canadian cities, Victoria prohibits graffiti using bylaws that classify it as a form of criminal mischief. Anti-graffiti policies are applied in the name of safety, cleanliness, order, and property rights. The most common response to graffiti has been to paint over it, usually beige or gray paint, a process that is called buffing. However, not only is this proven to be ineffective as a way to eliminate graffiti and to discourage graffiti, it has also had other results which were unintended. One that seems especially obvious to anyone who's an artist. Painting over graffiti creates a smoother, more even monochromatic surface that is ideal for graffiti. <laughs> All, it's sort of like priming the surface of a canvas for painting. The paint over approach, especially in continuous use, makes the services better and better for illegal art. Mark Halsey and Alison Young of Melbourne observed in 2016, oh, sorry, observed in 2016 the writer who repeatedly tags a wall that is consistently painted clean by authority knows from experience that there is a better than even chance a roller brush will eventually be used to bring the wall up to quote, pristine condition. If and when this occurs, the same writer knows that he or she has helped to turn a porous surface into a non-porous canvas. So the most common method for enforcing this prohibition actually makes more graffiti likely. A second approach also used in Victoria, which you see here, has been to gate off alleyways, restricting access to potential or known locations for graffiti. Authorities have not, despite decades of anti-graffiti practices, learned that writers and taggers like a challenge. The more seemingly inaccessible a spot, the greater the attraction. And as you will see, 
Uh, there is uh, graffiti that has been added since the anti-graffiti measures were put in place. And in fact, this alley, which is right next to my barber shop, so I get to see it a lot, uh, constantly has fresh graffiti. Um, I think, for instance, when people put up signs saying this area is under video surveillance and they think it's going to be deterrence, they're mistaking the fact that the millennial generation was brought up on YouTube. And so the idea of performing for the camera is naturally part of the crime. As you can see from these photographs, existing graffiti, older graffiti, was never painted over. It's thereby preserved in situ, observable between bars and fences, some of which get topped with razor wire. And I ask, could there be not a more perfect frame for illegal, transgressive, urban art? Also, new graffiti constantly appears despite fences and video cameras. Although it is produced without any expectation of duration, anti-graffiti actions have changed this, resulting in graffiti that lasts, in some case, for decades, creating a visual record of graffiti history. In other words, the city creates heritage graffiti. In other locations of Victoria, we see evidence of the back and forth struggle between the city and graffiti writers. Walls that were painted over quite regularly up until the summer of 2018, recently in September, have been left alone. This is the tracks in Victoria. While two other locations of what we call free walls, uh, Wildfire Bakery and 998 Cook, have existed for years. Free, a free wall means a wall that is free from city anti-graffiti action but the walls themselves are regulated and curated by the writers and the subculture itself, who, I discovered, have a very unique set of customs and rules supporting the notion that graffiti is, in fact, a subculture. Now, I'd like to consider also Victoria in terms of heritage. Victoria, as I'm sure you're aware, has a healthy tourist trade, and the city's history is one of its most marketed elements. Tours focus on architecture, heritage, and stories from the past, such as those run by the Architectural Institute of BC or John Adams' long-running series, The Ghost Walks. These tours tend to use the terms history and heritage interchangeably, and yet they're not the same thing, as geographer David Lowenthal very famously observed. Heritage and history rely on antithetical modes of persuasion. History seeks to convince by truth and succumbs to falsehood. Heritage exaggerates and omits, candidly invents and frankly forgets, and thrives on ignorance and error. Heritage is not a testable or even plausible version of the past. It is a declaration of faith in that past. History and heritage operate with fundamentally different standards of truth, even though they share language and subject. In a tourist town like Victoria, the anecdotal always rises above evidence-based stories, something that also draws a distinction between amateur and academic historians and between oral and text-based historical traditions. For the most part, the stories of Victoria's graffiti and street art are carried in the memories of the participants. These varying standards of truth produce urban paradoxes. One that is of particular note to art historians relates to the visual realm. In the name of urban heritage and in the service to the tourist market, historic buildings are cleaned up, repaired, and then covered in fresh coats of paint. The actual past, in terms of its historic surfaces, disappears from view and is replaced with a house, house paint gloss that is tied to the present and to present day needs or uses. If history looks to the past, heritage looks to the present, or perhaps represents how the past is currently of use to the present. Similarly, the restoration of older artworks, what I call the heritage treatment, also known as conservation, privileges one historic era over another. Locations are made to correspond to fairly specific historic monument moments freezing in time the conditions of a past reality in locations that are still subject to time. We see heritage sites as they appeared, 
not as they appear, giving us, in the words of architectural historian Ada Louise Huxtable, the way it never was. History and fiction blur. Heritage freely mixes historical fiction into itself, giving us the way it never was. This type of preservation through restoration leads to questions about how paint is used often to sanitize the past. This is true not just about graffiti, but also about works that are restored for the art market, a process that typically involves the removal of paint and the addition of hopefully discrete layers of new color. The controversies attending the exhibition and sale of Leonardo's Salvatore Monday in 2017 have drawn attention to the restoration techniques that appear to have been intense or at least aggressive in this case. This photo, which was taken during the restoration process and published by the Guardian newspaper in October 2018, damaged the reputation of restoration, especially its image as, of using a reverential light touch. In, in November 2017, this became the most expensive painting ever sold. For $450 million bought by Prince Bader of the Abu Dhabi Department of Culture and Tourism for the new Louvre in Abu Dhabi. Though clearly, we'll put them side by side, though clearly featuring a lot of new paint, the artwork is still considered a genuine work of 16th century art. In art and in our cities, fresh paint and a little tidying up seem to be acceptable and can actually enhance value. All value, that is, except for historic value. Now, turning back to Victoria, the city itself has a bylaw that targets graffiti, known as Property Maintenance Bylaw 7050. And that this requires property owners to remove graffiti, usually within one week, or the city will do it for them, and then bill them for it. This bylaw and this mode of enforcement is used in other Canadian cities as well, as is the ongoing paint-over response what is known as the Beige Brigade. While the city cites crime, safety, and health of the inhabitants, it also plays the heritage card. I've often wondered if all of these anti-graffiti actions are really justified. Graffiti hotlines, tag databases, neighborhood cleanups, police presentations to schools, and most importantly, the demonization of youth who are all branded anti-social vandals. Really, is our heritage threatened by graffiti? How can heritage status be downgraded by a tag? How does that work? Now, if you're thinking sort of, kind of, maybe yes, a little bit, I ask, what's the heritage value in freshly painted walls? And remember, painted, even if they're painted in historic paint, those it's not historic paint. What does cleanliness have to do with the past? The directive to neat and tidy, which is enacted in the present moment, is a direct action against the past. This sanitization of the urban environment does not indicate a positive relationship with the past, but instead kind of the opposite, an inability to deal with the basic fact of reality. Time is constant, everything gets old, dirt grows. And, la and lastly, as to the city's anti-graffiti actions, they're not working. I say this not with joy or because I have a plan for the city to get what they want, but just to note the barometer of the health of graffiti subculture on the island. It's not going anywhere. Now, ideas of heritage and history, interestingly, are also important to graffiti writers themselves. One phrase that is often repeated in conversations or in writings is, you gotta know your history. This is really the start of a writer's induction into graffiti subculture, and it comes as a guide and a warning. It is both advice 
look to more experienced artists for technical and social lessons, and a rule, respect your predecessors and their work. The latter is very important and is often enforced in fairly direct ways. As one writer explained to me, errors in terms of where or when to paint or painting over someone else's work, especially if it's a work of renown, are swiftly responded to, usually by having one's paint taken from them, or in rare cases, due to something really egregious, a light physical beating. As related to me, one young writer made a mistake of painting over a work by Ghost, whom we mentioned before. His real name was Hans Fear. And he is a writer who took his own life in 2001 following long struggles with schizophrenia. Ghost is a revered figure in the Victoria graffiti scene. Surviving works by him, which are very few, have been painted around. The young man who inadvertently painted over Ghost did not know his history. Something that was changed, I was told, by having his paint taken away and being given a black eye. And it didn't go beyond that. I don't want to think that they're, they're, you know, but that was enough. And he never did that again. While graffiti history is mostly preserved in the spoken oral form, it has been made easier with the advent of social media, websites, and also magazines and books. Two notable Canadian titles are Adam Melnick's Visual Orgasm, which is also a website, and A&P Bench's Against the Grain. Both document specifically graffiti in Canadian cities. While most online and published sources are image-based and focused on individual writers or crews, there are those that engage in a more theoretical consideration, such as the academic studies of Montreal graffiti and street art by Anna Vaklavec at Outlet Chemilovska. To such disciplinary studies, we can add a broad spectrum of non-art or non-art history fields that see graffiti, uh, that study graffiti as well. Now, my background in art history leads me naturally to see graffiti first as art, while others naturally see it first as vandalism. Studies in sociology, psychology, history, archaeology, anthropology, and criminology are interested in the illegal status of the work and its production and its existence. For me, the illegal status is important for how it influences the painting, the practice of painting, where the art is, where it can be, what is its condition, how long will it last. The painting process is the focus. Approaching the same painting with a focus on vandalism turns the painting into a symptom of a larger issue, a larger process with broad implications that produces questions about intention and social context. Graffiti's importance comes not from how it appears and was created, but from what it can be said to signify. The artistic goals of writers are, if considered at all, downplayed as secondary in importance, despite being central to the actual, actual practice of graffiti. Scholars can stare at painted walls and not see what's really written there in order to answer questions about why it was written. Paying attention to everything but what is written ignores the obviously visible fact that, quote, someone is trying to tell you something. The history of graffiti changed also in the 20th century with the expansion of the definition of vandalism. First used in the decades around the French Revolution to describe the destruction of property of public monuments, usually statues of kings and aristocrats, vandalism specifically referred to the destruction of cultural property, a use that changed. In 1972, UNESCO published the World Heritage Convention, which applied vandalism to all property destruction, and which was influenced by the growing legal notion of private property and property rights. Samuel Oliver Crichton Merrill notes the shift in emphasis this created. Quote, vandalism is no longer purely associated with cultural property and heritage, but instead it is now considered a criminal activity defined by the act of destruction rather than by the subject of that destruction. 
Such a wide, generalized view of vandalism, and thereby of graffiti, takes it away from heritage, culture, and art, and makes it a synonym for all property destruction. The label vandal also, and this is at least in Canada, seems to convey a distinct sense of shame that's different from criminal, especially when you combine it with terms like mindless or antisocial. And I should also note, again, it's, it's important to realize that the massive majority of the vandals are under the age of 20. All right. I'm arguing here in part for graffiti's historic value. Our understanding of different eras of human history is enhanced by the existence of graffiti, which provides additional and different voices from the past. Added to official records and memoirs of the renown, graffiti preserves the voices not heard in those histories, belonging to those of inadequate renown. In other words, one of us, regular people. These kinds of texts fill in the moments. They add color, both of race and class, to our shared history. Also, unlike the art that is found on inside walls, graffiti is not for sale, thereby freeing it from market pressures. Graffiti is easy to look at. Graffiti doesn't have opening and closing times. Graffiti is urban. It's free and usually brutally honest. In an essay about street art in Berlin, Bastian Anson describes his method for making sense of graffiti in the urban setting. Quote, in order to interpret the meaning of graffiti in and for the city, I consider its urban space as a linguistic landscape with various forms of street art making up crucial components of all language in it. Street artists, graffiti writers contribute significantly to the diverse voices expressed and heard in this linguistic landscape, end quote. Cities, history in general, speak with more than one voice. And cleaning up, restoring cities silences voices. And it distorts as well the actual lived historical record. While contemporary graffiti's origins in New York in the 1970s and 1980s are true, it's also true that graffiti has been found by archeologists in sites across the globe. And I also, I'm just showing you this. This is a tag, remember where you are. And again, speaking to the use of heritage ideas amongst the graffiti writers themselves. This is from uh, Victoria. From ancient Egypt, to Pompeii, there you see Pompeii, and that's um, from Egypt. Now you'll also note here that a lot of the scratching is from 19th century tourism. Um, that's just because I couldn't find a slide of Roman graffiti. But there's famous examples of graffiti left by Roman soldiers from the first century in Egypt as well. So again, graffiti itself has been around for, it's an old practice, I would suggest. Mayan temples as well, and of course, in a location that is all too familiar to all of us, public bathrooms, which have been locations for graffiti for as long as public bathrooms have been around. The custom of leaving messages, autographs, and bathroom walls is referred to as latrinalia. I would give you some examples, but to be honest, we've all heard them. People, although I actually men, because I can only speak for men, really haven't changed that much in thousands of years. Much like the everyday Latin left on the walls of Pompeii, or uh, graffiti does not conform to language or rhetorical standards, often to such an extent that viewers find the words or even the letters completely indecipherable. This highlights one of the subver subversive sides of graffiti. It's intrinsic politics, while also illustrating the reality that not every part of a city's linguistic landscape can be understood by every citizen. It reminds us of the diversity found in large social units in cities. And it's this variability that is what makes the urban environment unique and alive. 
The 20th century, outside of New York, provides other examples of noteworthy graffiti, which have often been the center of controversy or politics. Kilroy was here, when you see examples on the screen, was popular among US servicemen in the Second World War. The graffiti left in Berlin's Reichstag by Soviet soldiers in 1945 was later incorporated into Norman Foster's renovations of the buildings, which opened in 1995. And the photograph on the far side there is from 2015. As mentioned by Terry in her intro, the Polish city of Wroclaw uh, was a city that was known as Breslau and was part of Germany up until 1945 and as such was the site for state-sponsored, quote, patriotic vandalism, mainly in this case in the form of removal. Wroclaw presents examples of vandalism that negate rather than affirm something. And one of the things that struck me in Wroclaw as really, uh, both from an artistic perspective and from a historical perspective, were the number of empty plinths that you would find in the, in the uh, city. And these were plinths which had been monuments to uh, Breslau citizens, uh, who were obviously German. Uh, when the city became Polish, anything with German or reference to Germany was removed. But the plinths themselves were left in place. And so you end up getting these monuments to what I consider monuments about monuments. Perhaps, of course, the best known graffiti monument in the 20th century was the Berlin Wall. It's also Wroclaw. Which stood from 1961 to 1989. Now the west side of the wall, which is what you can see here at first, featured graffiti over the length of the wall and over the length of its existence. The east side did not see any graffiti until after 1989 and the fall of the GDR. In 1990, 100 artists from across the globe gathered in Berlin to produce a series of murals on the then clean, or rather pristine, east-facing wall sections. This would later become known as the East Side Gallery. For me, visiting the East Side Gallery in 2014 produced an early image, or early encounter with heritage graffiti, or at least graffiti that seemed to be operating by different rules. The mural from 1990, you can clearly see still, but it has been slightly obscured by subsequent tags and graffiti left by visitors to the city. The murals and the subsequent graffiti have value. Among other things, they capture the moment when the Cold War ended and also when current tourism in Berlin began, especially in this part of what was formerly East Berlin, where I think, as you can imagine, English-speaking tourists were not common at all. Uh, by the way, when you look at the, uh, the, the graffiti that left as well, it gives you a sense that leaving graffiti on the Berlin Wall has now, be has now become part of your trip to Berlin. Um, I often think, I always wonder what this young woman's mother actually thinks of this. You know, because I, because I was, among other things, firstly as well, you don't normally leave your name when you leave graffiti. It just seems kind of counterintuitive. But, um, but perfect trip to Berlin, love Camille, but also mom heart. So, you know, this may be really kind of questionable. But what it also just showed me is that graffiti is a process. It's a nonstop process. It's actually, in many ways, a barometer of urban life. Now, perhaps second only to New York for graffiti uh, is the city of London. And in the city of London, graffiti, because of a different way of controlling it, really captures the spirit of global culture. This is Middlesex Street in the city of London where the store shutters were painted by Ein with permission and the locals since dubbed it Alphabet Street. Ein also produced this mural at the head of the street as well. And you can see one of, the, one of the differences about art outside versus art inside 
is that art on the outside, as you can see there, and again, this is you know, not even nine years old, uh, how, what a rough, hostile environment it is with the, with the, uh, with the weather, especially in London. The, the letters on the shutters also serve as, as unique markers of time. They wear away, and in some cases, new businesses open or close. For instance, seeing uh, Alphabet Street in 2018, several of the shops, including um, uh, City Print, were new, uh, which meant that the shop that used to occupy the space next to City Print is now part of City Print, and thus Alphabet Street lost its G. And so as it's been going on, and as renovations continue, uh, the alphabet is broken into different units. But in some cases, as you can see here, the, uh, it, it still works. It's always nice when the name of the business matches the letter on its shutter. But this is not necessarily planned. Close by to Middlesex Street is Brick Lane which is also a very famous location for graffiti. And as you can see here, I was not by myself and ad alone admiring the many works of Brick Lane, but instead was, jo was joined by tourists who were mostly from France. Seems that the French kind of get this, uh, and families. And I took this photograph partly because I think it was a great alleyway I was in, but also because it was just such a great image that was counter to the idea that graffiti is synonymous with crime and you know, un, it's an unsafe space. Because as, as I photographed, I looked around to see something that was so nice. We have a young couple with their two children, and there's one of their children, and the other children is here. And this boy is literally chasing his sister around their, his, their parents. Uh, and so when you're in this space, it sounds kids laughing and running around, and also a lot of French, uh, really kind of counters that image that graffiti is synonymous with crime, um, and which is, and it is dangerous to people, because certainly that is definitely something that people talk about. Now, this is Rivington Street. Uh, and as you can see there, there are several uh, noteworthy figures. Invader, for instance, you can see in the, uh, the Pac-Man symbol. And please note the, uh, the young man at the bottom of the picture there. He's actually doing uh, graffiti um, in the daytime in London um, with a respirator, which I complimented it on, by the way, um, because it's often a thing for, with, in art school where you, you have to remind young people to you know, wear gloves. Um, uh, now, Rivington Street is renowned, especially because it has works by, uh, this is a work by Ein, uh, under the, uh, the, which is a, a bridge crossing uh, Rivington Street, and also works by Banksy. And uh, I want you to just, just look at that for a second. <laughs> because for, for an artist who uses irony in his images, it's kind of amazing to see one of his images given the heritage treatment. The wall is being protected from wearing away and weather by plexiglass. And so in this case, Banksy's stencil, including the stencil which he used to like to put on walls, which was declarations that there was a graffiti area, uh, in a way are sort of an ironic mockery of heritage. Uh, but the owner of the building, realizing you know, the, va the value and renown in his mind of Banksy, turned it into permanent heritage graffiti. Um, which is fine because in some cases, especially if in, in paper-based works, wheat-based works by Banksy, the, uh, the pieces are often torn off the walls and destroyed. Uh, so in this case, the preservation is, well, I'm very thankful for it in this case. Now, the last place that we look at in London is Leak Street Tunnel, uh, which is below Victoria train station. Truly, this is a gallery setting for graffiti. And you can see it even has lights at the top there. And yet, Leak Street Tunnel still operates by graffiti customs that are familiar to us in North America. The works here are transitory and current and Active. How active? Well, 
in July, on July 18th, England and their World Cup campaign came to an end when they lost to Croatia. Up until that game, the, fit, the football fans sang a song called It's Coming Home. And I was delighted to see on the next day, this photo was taken on July 19th. So uh, I watched the game with a lot of really unhappy Englishmen. Um, and then the next day I was wandering around and I love the fact that someone had already modified it to say, it's not coming home, all right? Graffiti is alive, active, all right? Which is, which despite Restora's attempts, you can't really say about Renaissance painting. Now, the last image though was perhaps the most surprising of Leak Street Tunnel. Uh, the group that you see here on bicycles, this is a bicycle tour. Uh, run, it's known as the um, Street Art Bicycle Tours of London. Uh, and these are incredibly popular with tourists. And the Leak Street Tunnel is the climax of their tour, the culminating stop. And after the guides give their history lesson, which I was delighted to sit and listen to, I chatted to them afterwards, uh, the tour participants are then given spray bombs to go and graffiti the walls, to leave their mark in this space. And as you can well imagine, part of the tour has been an introduction to the, the customs and rules of graffiti, uh, which is why, um, I mean, I like to think that none of them would paint directly over something that would look fairly recent. Uh, and in this way as well, uh, appreciation of both graffiti and an appreciation of the subculture of graffiti is promoted. Uh, as you've probably figured out by now, police in London have stopped prosecuting graffiti artists. After the 2012 Olympics, sorry, they stopped, sorry, stopped prosecuting graffiti artists after Olympics of 2012. And there were two main reasons for this. Budget cuts by the Conservative government, which led to a reassessment of policing priorities, and because it's not working. The cultural value, especially to tourists, also increased, and this led to concentrations in well-known graffiti locations. Now, closer to home, Vancouver. Vancouver has locations that draw writers and tourists and art historians, such as the Red Room Alley here, uh, and another key location, really important location, is 1001 Parker Street in East Vancouver, an address that is very well known in the art scene because it is the location for artist studios. While the criminalization of graffiti is unchanged, Vancouver police have chosen to direct writers to locations like Parker Street, a location that, as you can see, is not subject to the Beige Brigade. Like in London, Vancouver police do not rate graffiti very high on the priority list. Bylaws in Vancouver are similar to Victoria, with property owners being responsible for painting over graffiti, which means, in the end, someone's going to be mad. But in a way, isn't that anger part of the point? Just remember what Ellen Ruff said, graffiti is not meant to be liked. Or, in the words of Anna Vaklavec, graffiti writers continue to do what they do best, which is disrupt the cleaner, more institutional iconography and environment of the city. Vaklavec's mention, mention also mentions decay, and this will take us to our last two examples of heritage graffiti and will also take us back to Victoria. These are the tracks which we saw earlier. Now this is the key location for graffiti in Victoria. Starting in the 1990s, the tracks were also the sites for clashes with municipal authorities, police, the Beige Brigade, and was usually characterized as a scary place. Jodie Patterson of the Times Colonist is typical of these descriptions when she wrote in 2000, quote, it is a dark crime infested laneway. In 2001, a new approach was adopted, which called for, the, for a type of coexistence with graffiti while addressing neighborhood concerns about property damage and youth crime. With the enthusiastic support of municipal governments in both Victoria and Esquimalt, whose borders this site crosses, the rock solid foundation created the Trackside Art Gallery. Billed as the world's largest outdoor youth art gallery, Trackside featured billboards and lights displaying reproductions of paintings created by school-aged children. 
Through sponsorships with local businesses and grants, the foundation built 47 billboards above the level used by graffiti writers, which showed pictures on an anti-bullying theme. The goal was a coexistence. While the young artists were recompensed for their images and gained experience, such as mentoring by artists like Robert Bateman, the underlying motivation was crime prevention and beautification. The former identity continued with graffiti beneath the tracks and with Trackside's acronym, which was TAG. The efforts of the Rock Solid Foundation and the creation of Trackside were widely lauded in Victoria, even though the graffiti continued. However, within three years, the foundation was gone, meaning that the billboards were not changed or maintained, uh, neither were the lights. Very quickly, Trackside fell into ruin. The cities returned to their former responses, sending in the Beige Brigade and graffiti and police and location at, uh, and graffiti at this location more or less ground to an end at around the year 2010. Despite some efforts by locals to revive Trackside, who faced opposition from local residents fearful of the return of painting, the site has never been relaunched. I found the creation of contemporary ruins fascinating especially for what this dilapidation would reveal. As you can see in these photographs, crumbling billboards expose not just warehouse walls, but also graffiti that had never been painted over and instead had been preserved beneath construction, dating to at least 2001. At the, as the trackside art gallery crumbled, the tracks began to reemerge. Despite paint overs, the walls attracted graffiti, albeit in small and fairly unsophisticated, you can see here, fairly unsophisticated formats. Then, amazing thing happened. In August of 2018, the beige walls were painted end to end by writers who cleared away the weeds and also collected the trash at the site, thereby being prepared for people to argue about cleanliness. As you can see, look how nice it looks, right? So they kind of cleaned it up as well. The resurgence of the tracks came as a delightful surprise to many, including myself. And it made me wonder, is the war on graffiti over? One thing about this topic that is really clear to me, and it's true of contemporary art, is the story is never over. A film about the tracks and about trackside art gallery, which is called fittingly 100 Layers of Beige, premiered in Victoria in 2014. Now, the second location uh, I want to talk about as we head to our conclusion is this wall in Fernwood. And it's easier for me to tell this story off script. It's sort of harder to write. Um, so up until about 2014, this, everything you see red was covered in tags and graffiti and had been for at least 15 years. Because of it, it's in Fernwood and not visible from the street, it had not been uh, the property owner had not been coerced by the municipality to clean it up. Uh, however, the, uh, the building owner, who is naturally older, uh, was getting more and more fed up with the ongoing graffiti action. You could see there on the, the, the uh, garage door, Fernwood Coffee. So that was a coffee roaster. That is where the roasting is based. And I know Ben, who's the proprietor of Fernwood, and he told me the story. The property owner came to Ben and others and said, look, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna paint over the entire wall. Now, Ben was like, fine, but as he noted, he laid out, he's like, you can paint over this, paint over the whole wall, but don't paint over that. And the reason why Ben said that is because that is a work by ghost. Um, and as he said, as he told the owner, he's like, look, if you paint over everything, they're going to, there'll be more graffiti, and more importantly, they will um, scratch your glass which is when you put tags onto glass, which is really expensive to fix. Um, and so instead, Ben and others counseled the property owner to respect Ghost's work, uh, and he, he was assured that respect would be given back to him. And the result was this. As you can see, the work by Ghost was very carefully painted around. And I'm pleased to let you know, and I just, I, I, I this is fairly close to where I, I go on the weekends all the time. Um, for five years, there hasn't been one tag added to this wall. 
And it seemed to me that there was a message there, and that message was about respect. So, to conclude, there's a few things I want us to ponder. Graffiti seems to show a city's age. It doesn't get touched up, it doesn't get refreshed, it doesn't get repainted. It's a mark of time. This is one of the ways it can test the use of urban space with municipal authorities, specifically in the look, the cosmetics of the city. Because street lines get repainted, street signs are replaced, meridian grass is cut, municipal authorities actively manage the appearance of the city. They fight time. The city has to look new. The city should never look old. The city fights aging by keeping up its appearance. Now I understand that municipal governments are bound to respect order and represent control through clean, cleanliness and beautification. Yet this orientation to neat and tidy an entire city, which is enacted in the present moment, is an act against the past. Sanitizing the urban environment does not reveal a positive relationship with history, but sort of the opposite, something that's made clear in the dissonance between heritage and history in the city of Victoria. Now, if you're still hung up on the impact of tags on heritage, please, me, please know that in Victoria, heritage buildings are almost never tagged. Along with houses, heritage buildings are considered taboo. Even among graffiti writers, there are rules. But it is an irony that as a result of anti-graffiti actions, the lifespan of some graffiti has been extended well beyond the expectations of the writer. It was meant as a one-time event whose existence doesn't even really matter once it's done, but now can exist in some cases for decades. It's the doing, it's the act, it's the event of painting that is more important than the work that results from the act. This is partly why graffiti embraces age and time. The reward is not sought in permanence, but in impermanence. Graffiti doesn't aspire to be timeless. It refutes the fantasy that art is timeless, that art can address humanity across time and space by expressing universal ideas, even those ideas, even though those ideas are constantly changing. But we all participate in this fiction, but graffiti doesn't. Whether and other people, art is for the people and it's affected by the people. Timeless conveys cultural values and has a certain meaning when applied to art. That word points to the mirage of the refreshed surface. As we saw earlier, it leads to genuine, recently painted 16th century Renaissance art. Timelessness shuts people out. It shuts them down. It makes people mute and just nod in agreement rather than ask a simple question about how a flat surface covered in dry liquid could ever be timeless. The art historical value in graffiti is in its direct visual expression of everyday life by everyday people in contemporary urban and settings. It is unedited, perhaps indecipherable, ephemeral, singular. The walls sing zeitgeist. Now, even if property owners win the debate over vandalism, graffiti, and private property, it won't end graffiti. From a historical perspective, or rather from a historian's perspective, graffiti in Victoria is part of hip hop culture that has so affected and influenced youth culture and which endures decades after first appearing on the island. It's a pleasure to note that 2019 marks hip hop's 46th birthday um, and it's doing really well as it passes into middle age. Like rap, Skateboards, MCs, DJs, graffiti has survived decades of prohibition, demonization, along with hundreds of gallons of beige paint. Neither a youthful phase to grow out of, nor a mindless antisocial destruction, graffiti is the visual expression of subculture that, as anyone who travels around the world knows, is global, positive, social, and creative. And I'll leave you with this as we conclude, as a way to sort of think about this. When you, when you encounter graffiti, don't ask why someone does graffiti. Instead, ask how did they feel when they did graffiti? Thank you very much.